data search. It is a conference we have put on on Kevin Adams, our VP of Person, our VP of Community Live Streaming Possible, Casey, our board member at large, Tim. We we will get on a committee with us. You can talk or email us at membership at DM. So prices will never be this low. Go up in two weeks. So if you're unsure about whether or not you should attend and now, now talk to a board member because prices are going to go up and sure that you don't miss out on this conference. So much for you to SEO avalanche theory ranking factor the gate. But then and if you say, hey, SEO knowledge, not a problem of an automation in Facebook ads, keyword strategies. What about GA4, social media with TikTok that you can learn a little bit of this really hard in on one track is you don't, don't want to miss it and you get tickets before prices go up. Members also, if you're thinking about, know that anyone would discount on, on your and, and if you're not, let us know. We'd love, love to have dfwbscm.org job posting on our website. And then to this, we've got a virtual meeting. So here you tell us what so reach out to info at dfw or put something in the virtual meeting and make sure to be using the chat chat also virtual in chat and do some virtual notes to do that, that as well and over to mallory and our
Okay. Uh, I get it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more cases, use cases. Um, yeah, I mean, birthday parties, um, influencer stuff, you know. Uh, the tricky thing with POAPs is making sure that the unique string doesn't get out into the internet. Oh. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, how are y'all doing tonight? Good, glad to hear it. Thanks so much for having me. Isn't it crazy? It's already September. Um, well, my name is Mallory Patorno, and I'm going to talk today about navigating through digital account management with an eye for just precision. Uh, so I have seven years of experience in the e-commerce and digital marketing space myself. Uh, I've worked in multiple verticals like nonprofits, food, uh, food and beverage, luxury and lifestyle, retail, high fashion, you name it, I've probably dabbled in it a little bit. Uh, I have a unique experience where I have been not only the client, but I've also acted as the agency, um, also as the brand, and then the owner of individual franchises. Uh, today, I'm currently a senior e-commerce manager with Ambridge Hospitality, uh, so I'm responsible for how a handful of IHGs and Hiltons in the United States look, act, and feel online. I'm also the IHG brand champion for my company, so basically, I help uh, innovate the brand and I maintain a strategic relationship with them on behalf of my enterprise. I'm actually not the only Ambridge digital person in the room. Bart Peters at DFW SEM, he's our senior manager of SEO. Uh, and he's, you know, a fantastic resource. Hey, Bart, hope you're doing well tonight. Thanks, Mallory. So today I'm going to talk about digital account management, some best practices, and the experience that helped me form them along the way. Whether that's hiring and firing agencies, uh, the importance of utilizing various methods of communication, or just ensuring that you're staying well inside of uh, different types of policies, we're going to cover quite a few things. Before I get too far into it, I will acknowledge I am the fastest talking Cajun you will ever meet. So please bear with me. Um, and Kevin, I'm volunteering you that if I start to sound like a runaway train, you're going to let me know. So when I was asked to come and speak with y'all, I was really having trouble hammering down on a specific topic or a single story um, of what I was going to share. And Bart actually suggested that I take more of an omni-channel approach and discuss just overarching account management. So if you don't like today's conversation, you can direct your complaints to Bart. <laughs> it's no secret that digital marketing and e-commerce uh, is challenging even when we aren't in a global pandemic between meeting clients' expectations versus the realities that we're able to actualize, uh, to being a fireman and you know, trying to address things as they pop up, different emergencies, and also staying abreast of best practices from a variety of sources. It's not always a walk in the virtual park. So I'm gonna go over a handful of key points, about 11 of them or so, of things to keep in mind during onboarding and when you're talking to a client for the first few times. And then also things to keep in mind throughout navigating the relationship to make sure that everything is as optimized for not only your client and yourself. The first thing that I always make sure that I'm doing is setting realistic expectations. I wanna know what the client's KPIs are. Also, are they obtainable within the time frame that you know, we can actually work with them. Uh, also, means and frequency of communication. So I want to make sure that the client knows how I work and the best way to work with me. If that's a ticketing system versus sending me an email, I'm going to make sure my client knows that on day one. I want to make sure that my clients don't feel marooned on a digital island whenever I'm on PTO or away from my desk. I want to make sure that they know what support is available and how to efficiently get that support. I also really hammer down on being transparent and the need for it. You know, I'm one to always make sure that my client knows whenever I'm facing a challenge or a restraint based on our industry, but then I'm also quick to provide solutions. I'm sure I'm not the only person uh, today that has been asked to build a last minute landing page for an event that's three days away because we want to capture some of the demand that it's generating. Well, no, unfortunately it's gonna take that long just to build a page, much less deploy it live but can we leverage a channel that already has high levels of visibility, do a sponsored ad and pay a premium to perhaps get more impressions and in turn then conversions? That's a little bit more likely. I also make sure that my clients know whenever they're giving me five-star yacht dreams and funding me like a dinghy. Uh, you're not giving your channels a fair shake and even though you're going to want to get ABC as a result, 
we may in actuality have X, Y, Z happening, and I'm going to make sure that you know about it on that first day. We need to have crucial and candid conversations so that we can maintain and ha have a positive working relationship and grow our digital footprint. And I also make sure that I address these constraints before we are 60 to 90 days in and having a first check-in for the sake of trust. Uh, a client, if you, you know, go to them and you tell them that we need to make modifications that maybe you were already aware of going in, well, that's going to break that trust a little bit. They're going to ask, why didn't you tell me about this sooner, uh, knowing that we need to fund more. Communication is important during business as usual times um, because it matters tenfold during times of crises. By providing how you're best communicated with in advance during moments where it really matters, your client is going to know where to look and how to communicate with you. So I have a real, first of many real life examples. Uh, I recently had a situation where a brand that I supported had its online presence jeopardized for days. All of the systems were completely out of commission and if you weren't on the brand's mailing list, you were completely in the dark for relaying updates because not only the brand extranets were out of commission, all traditional forms of uh, communication, including phone lines and emails, were not available as well. Yeah, and it was for a global, global enterprise. Um, so when the lights started coming back on, one of the first initiative the company took was to make sure that everybody was subscribed to this newsletter because God forbid if this happens again or any sort of outage, they want to make sure that people are being relayed updates as quickly as they can, not calling through the grapevine people that they know are also in the same industry. The third thing that I want to touch on is deadlines. I always ask, what are the client's most immediate deadlines? Because, of course, things are usually in progress whenever we take on a new account. And can we accommodate them? Maybe we need to you know, have a little bit of meat in the middle situation. Uh, how do your SLAs factor in with what the client needs? And what are your SLAs in accordance with your scope of work and what the client needs you to do? It's really important to establish those boundaries immediately because you don't want to have a give your mouse a cookie situation where you allow the client to step out of scope once and then they continue doing the same thing over and over again because you allowed that request to not be accommodated. Sorry, you just uh, that SLA? Uh, make sure oh, that's... service level agreement. Make sure for, uh, no, absolutely. Um, so frequently I've encountered clients that don't understand the nuances of how their online presence interacts with the rest of the World Wide Web. Uh, and it's gotten me into some situations where I faced maybe some difficult, sometimes unobtainable tasks, like tripling a brand's referral traffic from a specific source where there was no demand that actually existed. Oh, and do that in one month. We can't create demand. So it's important to educate your clients on the different abilities that you do have and the resources that you have at your disposal as soon as you start that relationship. I'm sure I'm not the only one also that has been put in tight spots from a project perspective. Sometimes at four o'clock on a Friday, client comes in and just wants something done, especially from a graphic design perspective. Can you just do something small real quick? Uh, and this has happened to me multiple times at multiple companies, and sometimes I'm the graphic design department too, right? Um, because the client doesn't understand the cues that our different teams have to deal with internally. And so again, it's important to really emphasize on day one what those SLAs are, and how quickly we can accommodate things, including rush jobs. And is there an additional cost to factor in with that? Under promise and over deliver. We all know that SEM and SEO, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's like paying into a mortgage versus actually paying rent. So it's important to sit down uh, and explain with our clients the nuances of our world, because maybe they don't really understand why things take time, or why it's important to respond to reviews, or what Google's ranking factors are with SERPs. It's invaluable to take that time and invest it, even though it can be tedious, because when that click happens, the client knows that they're working with somebody that's really being on top of their digital marketing efforts, and you have an empowered client that knows how to use that relationship more effectively. On that note, it's always important to keep yourself educated. I make sure that I'm always educating myself and staying abreast of best practices, getting continuing education units whenever possible. It keeps me sharp whenever I'm interacting with clients. It makes sure that I know what levers and buttons I can pull and push uh, for different needs. And it further builds trust with the clients in itself, especially when they see all of these badges and certificates put on LinkedIn about the different skills that you're putting in your tool belt. They know that you're being the best digital advocate possible for the brand. 
The fourth thing that I always ask are, what are your business drivers? What causes somebody to go to your business and actually spend their money there? And what does that customer look like? And how do they behave online? This, as a digital marketer, helps you understand how to market and where. And even though the client doesn't always understand initially the question, it is key for yourself not only to know how you can convert leads online, but it also is imperative for your client's understanding of how you operate and your role in driving business for the client. So I have another real life example. Uh, recently, I was pitching the owner of a hotel in a secondary market in Wisconsin for digital marketing support services. He had said no, and this was a new build. This is a first time owner of this type of business. Uh, he had said no to his brand offered field marketing support, and he had said no to multiple agencies at the local level. level. So I stepped in as the management company, uh, and I asked for 30 minutes of his time so that I could really gain some perspective on why he kept on saying no to everybody. And within the first five minutes, I, I had an understanding. I'm not a Waldorf Astoria. Well, of course you're not a Waldorf Astoria, but you own a new asset and it needs to be marketed. Well, I don't have restaurants or bars or even a pool. I don't have the amenities that people expect at a hotel. And then I realized that we had to reposition this client's perspective of digital marketing. I explained to this, uh, th to this owner, and for the sake of anonymity, I'll call him Mr. Apple. Uh, Mr. Apple, I told him that he needed to reconsider his target guests and what they were looking for. As an owner, he was considering only himself and what he would be looking for in a type of a hotel stay. And so I explained to him that there's guests that are looking exactly for what you're selling. You're a new clean hotel, and you're on a very high, high traffic interstate, you offer free parking, free electric vehicle charging, free hot breakfast, and free fresh ground made to order coffee. Um, there's going to be people that are looking for these things. You just need to make sure that you're marketing yourself as the product that you are, the placement that you're in, and the type of customer that you will actually be booking. Don't go reaching for things that you're not, know who you are, and operate in that lane. Mr. Apple signed up for services that day, and now we have a 15 to 1 return on ad spend on all the initiatives that we're working through. The fifth thing that I want to make sure that we're doing is that we're preparing ourselves for roadblocks 100 miles before they happen. I like to ask my clients, what have you done that you've liked? What have you done that you hated? And maybe we can modify some of those things to fit in with overarching digital strategy. I've had a hotel that has told me, I know that I am in a great market for weddings. I know that my building would be great for weddings, but I never want to do a wedding. And this is coming from the owner of the property. Do not come to me with wedding business. It is a logistical nightmare for me. And also my existing guests don't like being interrupted with weddings. We've tried it way too many times in the past. So you know, when they tell me something as matter of factly as that, it really doesn't matter what my opinion is on the topic. I wouldn't bring it up because I don't want to risk not looking sensitive to the clients and desires for promotion and branding in mind. We always have to keep the clients branding in mind whenever we're operating, even as an agency. I've also had a restaurant client that loved doing giveaways, really with no rhyme or reason before I came on board. They just liked having uh, social engagement, nothing that would actually drive business. So I came in and we had a conversation and we decided to, we would have giveaways whenever we would do new product rollouts. And even if people didn't win the contest, we would give them a 10% off coupon that they would have to redeem in store. And so maybe they would be purchasing something from it. Um, I know that I probably don't have too many Louisianians in the room, but king cake is one of the best things since sliced bread, and it is a type of sliced bread where I'm from. But we actually made a bagel shop run out of king cakes consistently uh, because we were able to do a few giveaways, we generated interest, and then we had user-generated content that further amplified, oh, this is a great product, oh, I'm going and trying these new products, and we were able to really build off of the engagement and the branding that the customer originally had in mind. And while we're talking about branding, it's important whenever you're talking to a client for the first or second time about their creative and their copy. So how long do you think the typical customer looks at any sort of digital ad? Do you think it's five seconds? You think it's two, you think it's three? What do you think, Bart? Okay, it's actually eight, but that is the same as a goldfish. So we need to make sure that we're having that real moment of opportunity. We're maximizing it with the little goldfish that are looking at our ads online. So that means that we're employing an effective CTA. We're using the best imagery possible. 
And we're really putting ourselves out there with an offer that will cause somebody, again, with that eight second time frame, to go think about the value and click to be driven one of your channels. And again, if they have their, their current ads, it's fantastic to look at them and see if there's any opportunity for improvement immediately. The next thing that I always ask clients, if there was a magic wand that I can wave from digital marketing, an e-commerce perspective, what would it be? And usually that's to make money appear instantly on the table. And of course, that's not feasible. But do we have resources that can reduce the cost, perhaps outsource a task, that was typically delegated to a full-time employee that you're paying benefits to? Absolutely, and that's when leveraging your network becomes really important, and I'll talk about that later. I also ask about what are some frequent operational issues? What are your biggest pain points? Um, in the hotel world, I frequently hear people are wanting free breakfast and we've never given free breakfast. Um, in the retail world, I would have to deal with slow-moving inventory. Back in yesteryear, I was in charge of promotions and advertising for a large vapor manufacturer and retailer. We had over 180 SKUs. So you can imagine, some moved great. Others, like black jelly bean, not so much. Uh, <laughs> but it happened to be the start of February when I was posed with the question, can you help us move the bottom 25 SKUs so that we can either sell out or manage you know, the remaining of the inventory and let it you know, expire and we'll know not to let it restock? So I came up with doing a bracket challenge. So the bracket challenge had a couple of different uh, elements going to it. So I picked the 25, I took the 25 low performing SKUs, and then I sprinkled in a couple of mid-tier performers that way to generate a little bit of initial consumer interest. We let uh, the customers go and take this bracket, like you would with an NCAA bracket, and predict if you matched up certain flavors against certain flavors, who would be the ultimate winner. And if you were correct and your bracket wasn't busted, you won free e-juice for life. And of course, I needed to sit down with my employer multiple times and assure them through math that that was statistically impossible and we were just going to be generating uh, direct traffic and reducing inventory at the same time. So the part of the uh, contest right, of, of the campaign was that we had people that they had to verify their accounts through uh, ID. So you could only have one account per person. And so we allowed the accounts to log in and vote daily on a landing page to determine the matchup winners. And they could go for as many times as they wanted to during the voting period. Uh, better the, the discounts got better as the different flavors progressed. And we promised 40% off of the winning e-liquid flavor for the entire month of April. So we saw a spike in user-generated content. Not only did we want did customers want different flavors to keep moving through the, the process because they were their favorite flavors, we also saw people creating new accounts, like encouraging their friends and family that were smokers to get in and to learn what the product was like. Uh, and we had the entire company in on it. Uh, it was an all hands on deck experience. And so actually I'm going to show you a video of part of this campaign. It was it was a great it was a great experience. Yeah, it was it was a good for flavors, and they were getting competitive about them too. We had a Facebook group that had about eighty thousand folks in it, and you would they were taking camps. And some people, of course, you had your trolls that were pushing flavors like black jelly bean through, um, and then some people on the. <laughs> Hello, and uh, welcome and to, the, some, to the some. heart wildness. I'm not sure who I am, but I'm pretty sure it's Gabriel Cost. Cost. How are you, Jim? I'm not Jim. For the love of sweet Eju's, hi, Ruano. <laughs> Who's still in it to win it? Shake it away, Jim. Oh, man. Who's still in it to win it? The streak is still on one. Starstruck is shining bright, and one size fits all. Single game plan is working. Who else is there? Robert. I'm Robert. Happy Demise has not met one yet. Hold the Happy door Demise still holds on not and Snickerdoodle is sweet on the heels of victory. Jim, what else you got? Pinkle Twinkle is shining with victory in its eye and Tiger's Blood is here for hashtag winning. There are too many to name, Jeremy. So what about the current discount of remaining flavors? I'm Jeremy. Thanks, Jim. So what's about the, current the current discount is 16% on all remaining flavors, Jim. So very good is still in it. 
What do you think about that black jelly bean? It's not funny anymore. And for some reason, this flavor is still in the running. How is it still in the running? 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 Head over to BitWise.com and cast your vote. Remember, you'll be next for one of 50 pieces of hardware. Visit now to find out if your bracket is still in it. That's right, whoever you are. There's still time to it's save and win. It. Comment down below and tell us how your bracket is going. Comment, Comment down below and tell us how your bracket is going. But I'm Robert Jeremy. Happy March. 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 All right. Fantastic. So the winner was so very good. And as you can tell from the video, that our teams loved this campaign. They loved being involved with it and generating the consumer interest. Whether it was customer service or you saw a couple of fellows on our creative team, we even had operations really getting excited about what flavors they were able to throw in bags and sell. We had thousands of entries. Nobody busted their bracket. or Everybody busted their bracket. We had no winner. Uh, and we sold out multiple flavors that we needed to get rid of. Uh, and we, exactly, it was a fantastic, it was a great result. Um, ultimately, we had a mid-tier vape juice, so very good, it became the uh, best seller for the remainder of the company's lifetime. A more recent example uh, was a, one of my clients in the hotel industry. I noticed through social listening that a lot of rooms beyond a certain level uh, were getting fantastic reviews. And we actually weren't charging any sort of increased revenue for this, for, for the room rate. Uh, so we wound up increasing the rate of the room slightly, and we were able to make the clients incremental dollars that they were otherwise leaving on the table. And that's actually the view. You can see Alcatraz Island. Um, it's a pretty, pretty fantastic one. So the next thing that I want to make sure that we're all doing is leveraging all of the organic presence that we currently have. If you have a business that boasts electric vehicle charging, like Mr. Apple's hotel, make sure you have that amenity offered in Google My Business. Simple things like that can cause an increase in store visits and in turn conversions. Making sure that you're leveraging things like Google Posts and Google's Q&A feature also help in making sure that the guest experience is cohesive before they even step in the door. So I do like to also ask my clients, what are you trying to solve and what's your key performance indicator? Now, sometimes it's a concrete one, like growing traffic or conversion rate by a certain percentage. But a lot of times, they just want to do better. So we have to drill down on that. How do you want to do better? Do you want to grow your engagement? Do you want to grow your actual user-generated content? Do you want to have better photography or more concise copy? Do you want to increase your page views? Know what the customer is wanting, and then deliver that while also building in tangible e-commerce and e-marketing KPIs. One of the most important questions to ask, and honestly, it could be higher on this list, uh, and it should be understood by both parties, is what is the budget and is it currently being used effectively? Not every client understands that, yes, you're paying for me and for my brain and for me to action on things, but we do need to invest additional dollars into sponsored posts in a PPC and perhaps for tools and technology to help me, make, to help me be more effective in my role as your agent. On the flip side, oops. On the flip side, some clients are overspending and they're diminishing potential returns. Uh, that could be hammering up really high on the CPCs and not taking into consideration the strong organic presence that they may already have on a channel. We could take that funding and spend it more effectively somewhere else. Determining budget from day one is essential in making your roadmap as a digital marketer. And this includes discretionary funds. Quite frequently, I have encountered things, and I'm sure you have too, where in digital marketing, we have emerging technologies that appear all the time. And frequently, our clients don't actually budget for it in the prior year whenever they're setting all of these assumptions. So I've run into emerging technologies that would really benefit my clients. And some of them are able to scrounge together the dollars. They're able to get it from operations. They're able to take it from a different campaign. Maybe we have some funds left over. But also frequently, we didn't keep these opportunities in consideration, and so we miss a valuable time as the technology is really starting to you know, ramp up and take speed. We're, taking, we're losing out on an opportunity of high visibility and conversion. So what I do now is I actually make sure that all of my clients budget at least three to $500 a month, depending on the size of the business, whether we use it or not, as a discretionary e-commerce fund. So especially when it comes to budgets, knowledge is key. 
If a client knows that they're underfunding, they can then understand the limited results that they're having, especially when the business next door is investing 10 times the amount on the same channel. And as a marketer, it's very valuable to know what channels you're able to leverage because, of course, most things have costs. Um, and again, make sure that you don't go 30 to 60 days without asking for modifications that you know would benefit you on day one. The last thing that I want to talk about in this onboarding call are the different, or asking for different scopes of work, where relevant and permissible. Whether that's other businesses and agencies or just goods and services, it's good to know your obligations from an e-commerce and e-marketing approach whenever you're dealing with other entities on behalf of your client. Uh, for example, who owns the domain of certain websites? Is, it, is that the agency that's man managing the channel on the domain, or is it the brand's overarching IT team? Knowing what you're involved with and how, so that if and when you're faced with a challenge, you know how to approach it from a contract perspective. I've stepped into a client that was at the tail end of transitioning its websites on my first day. And when I asked who owned the domain, they did not know what a domain was. So they didn't know then after I broke it down if it was the old owner of, the, if it was the old agency, if it was going to be the new, and then we had to hand it over to the new agency. Um, it was also a recent acquisition, so we didn't know if the old owner had the domain or if it was part of the brand and if the brand had overarching control and support for the domain. Of course, while I'm trying to figure this out and Bart was helping me, this caused a delay in putting the new website live when it was ready. So, and the old website was already down and our guest service was temporarily disrupted. It could have been avoided. Again, after I ask all of these things on an onboarding call, I have a really good understanding of what the client wants, its position, and where it wants to be. And I can start making a game plan of the resources that the client is willing to invest in that would drive results based on the client's KPIs. That covers most of the elements that I try to, to discuss when onboarding and throughout the relationship that I maintain. I also constantly ask for feedback. Um, and I schedule an opportunity, if not on a monthly, then on a quarterly basis, that's specifically for going over campaign success and talking with our client. So about production, any opportunities, and if the client felt like we left anything on the table. And the same goes for me, right? It's a two-way transparent communication opportunity. So now that you made it through onboarding, what else? These are just a few things to keep in mind throughout maintaining the relationship. First and foremost, make sure that you're leveraging your network. Of course, a lot of us in this room probably have multiple skills that span a decent portion of the digital marketing sphere, but that doesn't mean that we should rely on only ourselves to get the job done without any help. If you're part of an agency, make sure that you're relying on the subject matter experts that can quickly resolve a question for you versus you getting caught in the weeds over something that is not your bread and butter. And if you're solo, that's fine. Use those LinkedIn and DFW SEM connections, et cetera, to get those questions answered and so that you can do your job as efficiently as possible. Instead of competing, empower. Your network is your net worth. When navigating client relationships, it's really important to know the political nuances of these relationships. It's equally as important as the tangible KPIs that we're trying to pursue. You need to know as an agency, uh, when you need to talk to the client, that's actually the person on the front lines of the business, maybe a manager of the subject matter on the regional level, or uh, you know, a regional vice president if you're dealing with a large corporation, um, or do you need to talk directly to the owner of the business themselves? That's something that takes time, but it's invaluable to learn because not only does it help you build that rapport and become invaluable to the team, it shows that you're able to respect the relationships and you'll advance yourself with the company. So from budgets to approvals, recognizing your key players makes work more manageable. I've had to interact in all of these hypothetical relationships. Of course, it, terms, it takes time to learn the subject matter areas and how to work with different personalities. But whenever you're able to do that, once it clicks, you're able to be a much more effective and efficient digital marketer. From budgets to campaign approvals, it makes it more manageable. On that note, it's important to recognize when you need outside help and when to let it go. I'm going to talk about agencies for a second. When I'm looking for an agency to work with or thinking that I'm in a place where I need to consider working with an agency, I ask myself, what are the key business functions that I'm lacking in, either experience or bandwidth, and sometimes both. And that's okay. It happens. Uh, then you want to think about who's capable and qualified to fill those needs. 
And again, it's important to leverage your network then because your network may have somebody or may be able to refer somebody that they really trust to fill those needs. And on the flip side, they may tell you to run away from somebody that didn't do them a favor. So here's a real life example. <laughs> Managing an agency relationship is an active job that requires almost daily communication. So when I worked for the Vapor retailer, one of my hats that I had to wear was managing an affiliate marketing program about 500 affiliates strong at any given time. So we brought on Adam, who's actually been a past speaker at DFW SEM, to help me navigate the affiliate relationships. Adam and I were in contact almost daily, and I was responsible for coordinating his and I's efforts with everybody else at my companies, whether that was creative, operations, or sales. I was putting an effort, extra effort to maintain that relationship and ensure it was effective. I had to make sure that Adam understood how my company operated, and I had to make sure how my company understood that my company understood how Adam operated. And so it was an interesting time. Hi, Adam, if you're watching this. <laughs> I also, on the flip side, have examples of firing an agency. So on one day after I joined a, a client, I did an audit of its digital marketing channels, and I saw that we had a vanity website that was very lackluster, um, for a lack of better words. Uh, so I brought this up to my internal team uh, that there were obvious holes in support. We're in the year 2021, and you have web pages talking about 2017 graduation. Congratulations. We needed to do, we had some holes that we needed to fill there, and I really didn't think that this vendor was doing us any favors. We were paying them thousands of dollars a month to maintain and to develop this website and to do different digital marketing activities that just simply weren't happening. It took my team some time to, to trust me. They told me on that first day, they said, hey, we hear you what you're saying, but we need you to put in a little bit more effort with this agency to ensure that it's nothing on our end. And so that's fine. I did it. But I made sure that my day one opinion stayed very well known and it never faltered. I stood my ground with it. Um, and so eight months and $10,000 later, my team was willing to listen to me and we were able to start to uh, pursue the contractual way to get out of things. And that, again, goes back to knowing the scope of work with the vendors that you're working with. Um, and of course, the agency tried to rely on their tenure with the, the client saying, oh, well, we really valued our, our relationship that's been five years in the making. Um, well, I had the receipts that said, well, no, you're taking my client for, for they're ta you're taking advantage of them. Um, you knew that they didn't know really digital marketing and the different things that they should be looking for on this website, and you just did not focus on us whatsoever. So also when managing multiple accounts, and sometimes I have clients, hotels, that are the same name in the same market, organization is key. Uh, again, communicate how you best operate. Use the ticketing system if you do use a ticketing system. But if you don't, that's fine. Use Outlook rules uh, to really help you stay organized. Peace out your work. So I will dedicate my time. My, I'll break up my week to working in certain markets and certain brands at any given time. And of course, pop flies always happen. Plan for it. I allocate an hour of my time each day to addressing emergencies as they pop up because they emergencies always happen in our world, right? Or everything is an emergency to somebody and it, you have to triage that a little bit. Um, again, use your technology to your advantage. So what I do with Outlook, even though I have a ticketing system, some people feel like they're special and they just email me all the time directly. So I have Outlook rules in place to go into subfolders for each specific client that I have. Uh, that way, whenever I do have the opportunity or it's their allocated time for me to look at things, I'll see it in a new folder unmarked as red. It's important to stay goal oriented anytime that you're having any sort of interaction with a client or maybe you're having a tough day and you're not even interacting with the client or working on one of their project, projects. Of course, yes, the tangibles, the, you know, the different KPIs that we're looking to make sure conversion rate, page views, things like that. Uh, we're looking at that at all times, but also we're just staying goal, and goal oriented when we're interacting and executing with our clients. So that means Client education and ensuring that the client knows what they're talking about. You know, don't don't let the client feel like you're, they're just talking to a brick wall that's just regurgitating information. Encouraging that two-way transparency and also protecting the relationship. That was something I learned very early on was that you need to keep the relationship of the clients in mind, that you're all trying to make money, and maybe the client just has a different perspective on how they could be making money. 
But again, you're the subject matter expert, so you need to own your subject matter area and work on that client education and communicate it transparently in a way that's effective for both parties. The next point is your personal ethics. So I've been bound by a bevy of policies to abide by, whether those are the brands that I support or the individual franchises inside of the brand. Uh, I've had to work in regulated industries, so I've had to follow state and federal legislation. Um, and then you have your own personal ethical code as a digital marketer. And some shiny object opportunities may pop up throughout, but it's never worth taking on the risk for a possible opportunity it's more worth to be protected and having a peace of mind at the end of the day. So this is also, I have a few real life examples with this. Um, I've lost affiliates that were making me tens of thousand dollars a month because they decided to not put FTC disclosures the minute that I started asking them to do so. Uh, I had street teams and some folks that operated hybrid Twitch influencers. They would do things in real life as well as online that wouldn't be able to validate their sales. So I had to lose the relationship. I also had affiliates that were being dishonest about following my standards as a brand, thinking that whenever I'm turning to blind eye and three o'clock at night and I'm sleeping, that they can get away with things. I don't care how much money you're making me. We cannot maintain that relationship. The short dip in revenue is worth it because when you're an effective digital marketer, you'll be able to make that revenue back. You need to make sure that it's in a way that's white hat and that you're not going to be penalized in the long run by any sort of legislative entity or by Google. Moral of the story is just be ethical. Be ethical with your network, be ethical with your clients, and be ethical with your customers. Put yourself in the, in the customer's shoes. Nobody wants to drive 13 hours to a hotel in Southern Florida only to find out that their hotel pool has been out of commission for six weeks and it will be out of commission for another three months. A property alert and a refined pre-state email message could have assisted and avoided having that you know, missed expectation whenever the guest walks in the door. Same with, you know, having emails that you perhaps have the opportunity to get from a data broker. Make sure that you're actually generating those leads in a way that's ethical and that it's going to make people want to interact with your brand. Because if you just buy an email address, sure, great, you're able to send out an email, but that's going to damage your perception in the long run. And so on that note, make sure that you're standing your ground. Because sometimes you're forced into these situations by other teams, by your clients, by you know, just different business situations. So make sure that you're owning your subject matter area and you're being stubborn about it. And speak confidently, confidence is key. But sometimes you have to talk with your interdepartmental folks about why we can't just go and buy an email list. I'm so sorry, sales, that's not how it works. Um, or you need to explain operations that exactly that landing page can't go up immediately. It's just standing your ground and advocating for your own disciplines, policies, and your goals. And that way, and again, keeping that goal in mind, we're all trying to make money together. We just need to make sure that we're respecting each other's individual disciplines. You need to own it to show that you're the subject matter expert. And that way you're seen as an asset and not just a chore to manage. And of course, this is not going to make you fireproof. Things are going to happen. Accidental website migrations, they happen to where you suddenly have to put on your content management hard hat and go and investigate why every single bottle of vape juice on your website is replaced with a Nikon camera. You need to go and switch the photos out, and then you need to make sure that every link online does indeed link to vape juice. Crimes happen too, and you can't, you can't help it. I was actually two days in to one of my first PR internship jobs with not as much supervision as I should have had, and there was a shooting at my apartment complex. So things happen, right? Uh, also, things that happen, legal and legislative matters that tie your hands. When Google declared me a vice product in 2018, it was a rough week. I lost relationships that I had been spending a lot of time building, contracts that were already signed, sealed, delivered. But I mean, not even Adopt a Highway wanted to work with me anymore. It was, and then on top of that, I was facing scrutiny from the media, and I was seeing governors uh, declare the e-commerce sale of my good illegal which for an e-commerce company, I'm sure you can imagine how bad that was and how that ended up. But that's okay, because with all of those fires come all of the wins. Like taking the, harnessing all of the collective power of your entire team to overcome an accidental website migration, which has happened three times already in my career. <laughs> Sometimes it feels invigorating to pitch that impossible lead and win it thanks to a quality one-on-one -on -one conversation. There's nothing that beats the feeling of getting rid of the bad, expensive vendor 
that's running your client through the loop because they weren't educated properly from the get-go. And it's thanks to things like communication, education, and standing my ground that I've had clients where I've increased our revenue 117% year over year. And actually, that client made it on stage at its brand's main uh, conference. And it wasn't because they were pulling every lever possible. It's actually an outdated asset. Uh, it's a smaller asset. It's, in a, it's you know, in a subpar market. But even though we don't pull all the traditional levers, we know what works for us, and we execute accordingly. And I don't know about y'all, but those wins are my daily motivation to continue being in this role. So communicate, educate, stay calm, and don't burn a bridge. Especially in times of COVID, it can get tough, but this is the saying that I keep telling myself over and over. Because you never know when someone that you meet at DFW SEM years ago will then become a colleague, and then years later, you're full circle speaking at DFW SEM. Thank you so much for your time, and feel free to add me on LinkedIn so we can chat more. Thank you. So my question would be, and I don't know if they can hear me, so let's just type it out, they can't hear. Um, so being in, I have a client that's in a super niche market, and he has a uh, e-commerce store on his website, and mm -hmm. he has four products. It's a tough, tough market to be in. So my challenge is, you know, many years ago, he had no issues and no problems. In today's world, he's struggling, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I've tried a lot of different things. I've had to rebuild his website because that was a mess. And, you know, so it's baby steps. But, you know, they want it. Right. Recently. Of course, they always do. <laughs> my biggest thing is, um, how do I get him out there to get sales, really? Um, I will frequently send to my clients if I see any helpful webinars or things like that that would further incentivize them to be out in the field more um, because it's a hand-in-hand -hand thing, right? We are responsible for the digital piece and generating leads online, but you definitely need to have an offline presence as well to further bolster that. Not every e-commerce store. I was very unique with the vapor manufacturer because that did start out as solely e-commerce and then we branched into brick and mortar. Um, not every company is going to be like that. So it really is encouraging whether it's doing small trade shows, um, farmers markets, things like that. I'm not really, I don't know what product, type of product line well, it is. But, oh, okay. So never mind. Don't go to, don't go to farmers markets, but trade shows. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, try to see what industry resources are out there, whether it's a network that he can be part of um, and it's kind of like a BNI type where you, you know, are able to trade business with one another. Yeah. That would be one of my first first things to try to tackle. Yeah. Let's see, do we have any other questions? So I talked about, uh, talk about the trust signals for an already existing customer continuing to reinforce your own skill set like mm -hmm. does that way. I always thought of it as like a sales thing, but like you're talking about like after the fact, making sure that, you know, mm -hmm. lining up that stuff so they know the expertise that you've got. Well, yeah. So they you up going, oh, okay, I feel, I feel increasingly confident. Well, once you've signed the contract, that's when the real work begins. You have to maintain that relationship. That way your competition doesn't go in and try to poach the business from you. Mm -hmm. We're all in sales. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, I enjoy being approached with business issues and you know things that we can do creatively. And and that job was really fun. We get to, we got to throw spaghetti at the wall when it came to to e commerce and digital marketing. So, and they just let me run with things all the time. Uh, when consumer trust in e-liquid started to get really damaged, uh, I was the only vapor company, to my knowledge, that actually brought in a very large YouTuber to come back into our factory and do a segment e-liquid, how it's made. And they followed a bottle of e-juice from its start in the manufacturing facility until it wound up being shipped out the door. Um, and then it followed the shipping process as well. Mm-hmm. 
It was fun. No, we didn't. Uh, the McDelicious, though, that was it was a whole thing in itself. It was a very polarizing flavor. But again, we had it was very unique because this company we had the warehouse side, which had the factories and the labs and where everything was stored and sent out. And then you had the corporate office immediately in the same building. So I would walk over to research and development and I'd say, "Hey, I'm bringing in an influencer, the same influence I brought back for eJuice, how it's made." I was like, "He told me that his favorite." thing to eat is chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes. Can we make an e-juice out of it? And so then we did vape roulette with the influencer. And sometimes the hits of the, the chicken fried steak were good. Sometimes they had like actual like pepper hits in it too. And so it would, yeah, it was really funny. You can still watch a lot of the Vape Wild YouTube videos. They have some of them up still and they're extremely entertaining. Vape Wild. Vape Wild. We were serious about vaping and not much else. Will it blend, guy? Remember that song? Yeah, yeah. No, we. Not around anymore? No, actually, we. Uh, the company collapsed with the rise of the PMTA requirements, so it was going to require, and that was one of the reasons why I had to uh, cut down on SKUs um, during the early days of the PMTA rollout. We thought it would be about two hundred and fifty thousand to register each individual SKU. It would be a million, so it forced a lot of vapor companies out of business. Wow. Oh, wow. Mm hmm. That's why vaping is taking a tank in the United States now. And that's a whole different co topic I could talk about is how big tobacco is just messing with the vapor industry. Oh, I'm but. sure they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been around too long. They're not going to let you come in and take over. We were taking way too big of a hit out of their sales. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That was fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, no. I learned